Hello and welcome to episode two of our new showing the talking point here on the Rangers Review. I'm Chris Jack and I'm again joined by Stevie Clifford as we take an in-depth look at one of the key issues of which there are many of course on or off the field at Ibrox. Um, firstly, a uh, thank you to all of you who tuned into our first show a couple of weeks ago. We were delighted with the numbers and the reaction to it. We will be with you every fortnight as, um, as planned at present and we really appreciate your support on the show. The, the first episode focused on the issues at Ibrox and the works in the Copeland stand. And since then, the third shipment of steel has been delivered. Work is progressing well. As it stands, Rangers hope to be back at Ibrox by the end of next month. When myself and Stevie spoke about an idea for our second show, the theme of the chief exec position was the first point that we came to. Since then, Jim Gillespie has become the front runner to be the new chief exec at Ibrox. Stevie, the idea for our next show is for Rangers to sign five players and win the treble this season to see if we can keep this up in terms of talking points. Um, let's go. Let's go back a couple of months and we will start at the start at the beginning of the the chief exec story. Um, James Bisgrove, um, he had a year in the position um, after being appointed by John Bennett last summer. Also they worked closely with the chairman and Michael Beale to rebuild the uh, the squad. In October, he then, alongside John, led, led the search that resulted in Philippe Clement becoming the manager. When the news first broke that James was moving on and leaving the club, um, how did you view it? Did you think it was a, a good move? Were you surprised at the at the timing and surprised that James would be would be moving on? Um, I think there was an acceptance at the club that at some point he would go on to bigger and better things, but I don't think there was a, a feeling that Saudi Arabia would be his his next port of call. Um, yeah, I mean, I always expected James to move on. James is always very career oriented. I think that was clear when he came in commercially. He, you know, he he took the income to ten million, then trebled it to thirty, and then you know took us closer to to mid kind of 30, 35 or so. He, he was at moved on to become CEO. I think as a direct result, I think Rangers of or probably Rangers trying to keep him. I think at that point there was a lot of interest in James and Rangers were, you know, keen that James didn't go anywhere. I think my biggest issue is not that he moved on, that it was less than a year because that doesn't really speak volumes for where our project is and what we were wanting to do. I would have been quite happy to see James stay three or four years and then go, having put in a proper foundation. That didn't happen, which is fine. Sometimes in life you get a and ultimately a life-changing opportunity, which he got, money talks, and that's not a not a slight on James. And, you know, what I mean by that is that it's obviously an unbelievable offer to take him out there for his, himself, future, you know, his partner, etc. So I have no issues with that and and, and that being the, the truth of the matter. Where it becomes problematic for me is he's going the same time as, a, you know, head of academy. There's other people leaving the club. It's... You know, that's where it becomes a wee bit difficult, you know, so many people leaving. And I think that was a problem with the with the support as well, Chris. I think that, you know, I think that that becomes, for, for everybody watching, the big thing. Because why are so many people jumping? So what I don't like about it is, you know, before I kind of get to, like, his legacy and we just dis we discuss that, is it, what I don't like about the fact that he's left is that, you know, I think a lot of people have put a lot of things onto James that, that maybe he's not been directly responsible for. And, um, you know, when you think about even Michael Beale the other day, you know, talking about, you know, Fashion Sakala and how he wanted to keep Fashion Sakala, which is completely the opposite of what actually went on. And talking about, you know, how James Bisgrove done all the contract negotiations, how the, again, completely not what went on. So I think James has become a, a lightning rod and a, and a scapegoat for many people at Rangers just to, to blame him completely on everything. So that's that's been a, a bit of a disappointment for me. I think overall, James, you know, his legacy and, and how he will be remembered, Chris, is, is completely different to that, I would say. I think the that, that point of it's, it's easier to pin things on a man that's no longer in the building probably is probably an accurate one, um, certainly in certainly in some regards, 
as you outlined there, Steve, there was the commercial revenues. He was a big pusher behind you, Edmondson House, the sports bar, the Castor deal is also something that he was heavily involved in, and the Australia friendly debacle saga, however you want to um, frame it. I think a lot of fans perhaps didn't trust him after that. He carried a lot of the, the blame for that. But again, to go back to the point that you made, it was his job to explore these possibilities and there should have been other people at the club who at various different points of that saga stepped in and said, by the way, James, this isn't the right thing for the football club. It shouldn't have got to the stage that it did before there was the outcry. There's enough Rangers experience in and around the football club to point them in a certain direction. I did a big interview with Dave King um, a few months ago and talking a bit about the chairman and why the club are in safer financial hands under under John's uh, stewardship. And he spoke about James being one of the smartest young guys within the game, clearly had a lot of um, faith, in, faith in him. But that faith wasn't always perhaps repaid or felt by the felt by the fans. Is, is that fair? Like he was he was a lot more public facing than Stuart Robertson. He was a lot more media savvy than, than Stuart Robertson. But as you say, he was only only there for twelve months and perhaps didn't get a chance to really leave leave a legacy that's more more of a positive one because people will just okay, rack up these uh, rack up these points, some of which he has to take the blame for, others that, as you say, perhaps are, uh, it's easier to point the finger now that he's, he's no longer here to uh, defend himself on them. Yeah, it's definitely easier to point the, the blame finger, that's that's for sure. Um, also seen, you know, I think, it, how, how for me it's easier to explain this of that when Rangers aren't winning on the park, Chris, some things become massively overinflated off it. And I think the scrutiny on guys like James and, and things like that. Look, Australia wasn't good. Australia was a complete mistake. It was a complete misjudgment. Rangers should have been more forward-facing than that. I, that was something we went heavy with the club on as well. We we literally could have warned them what would have happened if they hadn't for some reason seen it themselves, which they didn't. But James at least had the balls to, to stand there and, and answer his critics. He went straight on Rangers TV, he made himself available to speak to fan media made himself available to speak about why he made those decisions. And from a commercial point of view, it made complete sense. We would get would have got more for that one game than we would have got in the whole year for for um for, for winning the league, for example. So I get it sometimes, you know, as I said, this is what I mean about James being very career orientated and things like that. And and he wanted things like building the museum, building better disabled access, all these things tick boxes for James on his career path mm -hmm. and things like that. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that in terms of what he wanted to achieve. And he's ultimately provided Rangers with, you know, a, a museum, a, a state-of-the-art building where they can hold events and stuff like that. There's there's a new restaurant, Ibrox, Gordon Ramsay's in the building. You know, Castor, for all that people criticise it, gave Rangers almost £8 million last financial year. So there's there's a lot there that James has done is really positive and and yeah he came in when commercially we were at zero, and it could only have went up. But I think mm -hmm. to the levels he's got it. I think Kareem Varani's a, a fairly well thought of guy. You know, um, he's he's again, will put his own stamp on things. Chris commercially, there's going to be new deals announced that are very favourable for the club as well. So I think that I think that James put in building blocks in his time as ceo he never really it would have been interesting to see him as ceo trying to oversee this summer mm -hmm. that would have been quite interesting to see how he had negotiated that there's obviously been a, a a really big change in rangers attitude to transfers to the squad to the wages which was long overdue long overdue and you know we're basically hemorrhaging money at points and, and without the club throughout the club. So I, uh, I I think that I think that would have been interesting, yeah, to see James Briscoe. It almost feels like see to sum up his tenure as as CEO. I think it almost feels like there's so much unfinished business mm -hmm. that should have been that, that was there. It never really materialized to anything. He's now became the blame for Ibrox. He's became the blame for last summer from Michael Beal. Of course, it was never Michael Beal's fault. And um, he, he, became, he 
he's got the, the fault of, of a number of things, which I don't strictly think is true. So, moving on a wee bit, Chris, obviously it's been reported now that Jim Gillespie is a man who's been identified as a new CEO. You know, John Bennett stepped up for several months and he's he's kind of led that. He's led the interviews and things like that. Tell us about Jim Gillespie, because perhaps, you know, wider support won't know a lot about him. I, I certainly can't claim to be, you know, the most knowledgeable. So take us to Jim Gillespie and tell us about him. I think the the process is actually a, an interesting one because after after James left earlier this year, it was decided early on that as you as you mentioned there, John Bennett would assume this executive chairman role and the the mood from the club and all the work from the club was this is the this is the best way to do it. This will ensure things are um, handled properly in terms of the in terms of the transfer window. At that stage, the transfer window was the main item on the agenda. Of course, the iBox issue then became the main item on the agenda. John has had a lot on his plate to deal with in terms of that rebuilding work and the and the rebuild on the on the squad as well. Um, so it was a every every briefing, every conversation, it was a case of the CEO search has been has been parked. It's not urgent. It's business as usual behind the scenes, and the club are really keen to try and move in that uh, move in that way. Um, over the last couple of weeks, though, obviously. That search from being on the back burner has been put back on the on the front page. It has to it had to step up at some point. Um, John has obviously been going through that process as the as the main driver of that over the last couple of weeks. And as you say, it was reported last Saturday, I think it was, that Jim Gillespie of St. Mirren is the as the man that has been identified as the as the new chief exec. Again, he's someone I, I recognise the name. I knew of of him, but don't know a lot about his about his work. Um, so I've spoken to a couple of people about him to try and get a gauge what Rangers will be getting if this if this uh, deal is done. Um, people at Ibrooks not saying a lot on it at all, so I had to go to the I had to go to the other end of it. Um, so Jim joined the St Mirren board in March 2020. So I've been there for just over over four years now. He was the Kibble uh, representative on the board. So for people that don't know, Kibble is the, the Renfrewshire-based charity which uh, took a stake in St Mirren um, a few seasons ago and has allowed St Mirren to become a fan-owned, uh, fan-run uh, club. Um, also, Keith Lasley is now there as, as chief exec. Um, Jim became vice chair in April 21. And it's understood that he was actually a, a big driving force in St Mirren getting involved in St Mirren, uh, or in, in Kibble, sorry, getting involved in St Mirren in the, in the first place. Um, he is still the, the, the Kibble uh, chief exec. He's won awards um, for his work during the uh, during his time there. But I think his his appointment probably still comes as a bit of a, a surprise, if you like. Now you look at some of the other names that have been mentioned, we've spoken before about the, the profile of... Um, of the, the kind of ideal ideal candidate, it is said that um, it's believed that he is a is a Rangers fan. Also has contacts at the at the club. Andrew McKinley at, at Hearts was one of, was one of the other names that was uh, previously linked. I think that story was, it was six weeks or so ago. There's been a couple of others that have done the rounds and been bounced about uh, behind behind closed doors. Um, I actually know of one um, potential candidate. Good experience, a real track record down south that was interested in the in the position, but uh, wasn't spoken to for it. When it comes to the profile of the appointment, Stevie, were you expecting someone who's perhaps a bit more of a, a bit more of a name, a bit more of a household name, has a bit more of a public track record? I dare say it's quite like signing players. Now you you're always attracted to players that you know, players that have come from a higher quality league. Are we doing Jim Gillespie a disservice because he has only, I feel like, come from come from St Mirren, or do you think that the fans were looking for to someone that just had a bit more of a, a, a higher profile and perhaps more of a, a track record behind them? Here's the problem, Chris. Right from a fan's viewpoint, as you know, as yourself, and and we've heard many feedback from supporters. The problem with Jim Gillespie isn't that. Jim Gillespie's not the right appointment or that Jim Gillespie isn't the best man for this position. The problem is that Jim, Jim Gillespie's 10 miles up the road and, mm -hmm. you know, a Rangers fan and just seems like an easy option. Doesn't seem like the best option. And this is a problem. Now, 
people will automatically go to and i've already gone to he'll know people on our board this is a cheap option he's a pal he's a choice what's he really done as a ceo this is lazy we've been here before and to be honest that's right from mm -hmm. the point of view we have been here before and we have taken the easy option and we have taken the cheap option and it's not worked now the ceo position look we talked about this on on four lads podcast at the start of the week that there's names out there right mark ashton recently appointed ceo of ipswich bristol city west brom watford when they gained promotion to the premier league these guys are there gary sweet ceo of luton town won championships chief executive of the year award then you've got david Brody at coventry since ceo since 2017 they've went up the leagues signed the likes of ellis sim hadji wright so gustavo hammer and guy carries for 17 and 24 million i'm not saying right and let's just quantify this mm -hmm. i'm not saying that we can get these guys chris right i'm not saying we can because english market and they may be well out of our wage everything show a wee bit of ambition rangers fans want us to try and attract the best ceo for the position right i wouldn't even have mind it if they'd went and got a lower level ceo but somebody that at least had the experience now jim gillespie hasn't got experience as a ceo this is rangers it's not with all due respect it's not kibble and it's not st mirren mm -hmm. and that's with the greatest of respect it really really is rangers is massive and you've seen that just by the mistakes that we spoke about james bisgrove making this is a guy that made 40 odd million commercially signed all sorts of brilliant deals built museums restaurants was behind all that sort of stuff but wanted to take us to australia for a friendly and mm -hmm. never recovered in the eyes of the fans you get one chance right it's such a big job and i think the issue with fans is chris and honestly i just think the fans are going to see this as being a mistake as being the easy option chris and i, and I really think that that's the the biggest issue here it's not that he isn't the right guy for the job mm -hmm. it's not that he he you know won't do a good job it's that before he's even in the role fans have already decided because it's the same path that we follow all the time a path that hasn't worked that's why people just genuinely wanted a ceo of the best available possibility mm -hmm. i'm not saying the guys i say could be but think outside the box go and advertise have we advertised you said there was a guy down south we see your experience if we didn't even talk to him that tells me that is predetermined and then you go back to looking at you know the accusation that he maybe knows people on the board and this is an easy appointment people will think that so before he's even in the door the mind's made up and that's the issue that jim gillespie has and he's not even started yet and he might not even get the job this is all still speculation until we know elsewhere but at the moment fans are already made mind up mm -hmm. You know, and that's the, as you say, that's a. It's not a case of we're we're putting a downer on him because, as far as I'm aware, we both don't know him personally. We don't, um, yeah. we don't know his his qualities, but it's a it's a perception thing. Uh, it's how, how how is he going to be perceived? And that's not a case of we are going to sit on the show and fans will come on the show and we'll give him a hard time and we'll give the club a kicking just for the sake of it. It's just questioning whether this is the no no matter whether it was Jim or whether it was Andrew McKinley or whether it was any of the guys that you outlined there, whether it was someone brought in from Australia or someone brought in from Italy, the fans are right to question the process, they're right to question the people, they're right to question, does this person have the have the background? It's not to I say it's not to give them a kick in, it's not to get them off on a, on a negative um on a negative footing. The fans just want the right people, whether it's chairman, chief exec, whether it's physiotherapist, whether it's football manager, whether it's num number nine or goalkeeper, fans want the best best person in every position as as possible. Um, to be a bit more as about um, Jim as you as you touched on there, I, I think it, it is a big it's a big jump to go from St Burn to Rangers. Whether you are a midfielder going from St Burn to Rangers, it's a big jump. Chief exec, it's a big jump. So it doesn't have there's nothing on the CV that says I've worked at a company or worked at a club the size of Rangers because he's not. Um, we do hope, and clearly the, the board will be hoping that if he does get the job, 
that it's a it's a step up. You look at players that come from smaller clubs and can then step into a role and become dangerous players. It almost feels the same thing with Jim Gillespie. They're hoping that he can make that step up to become a Rangers chief exec. Um, his time at St Byrne, as, as we understand, that he is the the main point of contact between the the football department and and the boardroom, if you like. Works really closely with. Stephen Robinson, the manager there, and was really influential in Stephen deciding to, to make the move back up to Scotland. He also left uh, Morecambe a couple of seasons ago and came back to Scottish football and was, by all accounts, sold on that vision for the football club. Um, I think as we spoke about pre-match on Saturday, St Mirren, from the outside looking in, does seem to be a well-run club at present. Now, they've, they've had a number of successes um, on, the, on the field, played European football this season, seem to recruit well, have sold players on. They've you know, got a manager that the fans like. Their, their fan engagement seems to be seems to be good. So there does seem to be a lot to a lot to like. Um but it's it's levels. It's as you outlined it's St Mirren is with all respect to them. St Mirren is there and Rangers is Rangers is a, not up that level. Um so he's works very closely with I say Stephen Robinson and, and Keith Lasley, who I mentioned earlier on as their as their chief exec. And it has been said to me that he's perhaps the most involved and influential director on that on that board. That he's he's closer he's closer to the players, um, familiar with the players, unlike some who are perhaps less involved day to day. He is actually part time at St. Bernard's. It has still has that involvement with with Kibble, um, but does play a major role in like, club decisions and certainly in the in the transfer fee. Um, sphere um, when it came to Alec Gogic, for example, St. Byrne were able to, to hold on to him over the summer, signed a new deal, and it's understood that Jim was a, a kind of key part in that um, in that process and that in that discussion. So there, there's perhaps things there from recent years at St. Byrne that point to him being involved in a football sense and being able to take the club forward in a football sense, but it then comes back to that point of this is Rangers, this is a bigger fish. This is a bigger business. There is more, there are more eyes on you. There's more media spotlight on you. There's more pressure on you. And it's can you, can you step that up? Um, and that's not just in a in a football sense. That's not just in a in a sporting sense. That's financially. I think one of the big things um, from a Rangers chief exec that's politically it's making friends and influencing people. Something that the football club has not been not been good enough at over over recent years. I know something we've spoken about. The next man in has to be able to shake hands, kiss babies, and get and get things done. Uh, Rangers need to be more influential within Scottish football once again. Yeah, that's what something I was going to highlight to you is that at least Jim Gillespie isn't coming in completely, you know, unfamiliar with the mm-hmm. surroundings of, of Scottish football. As you pointed out, he is a Rangers fan. He is a season ticket holder. He should be well aware of the landscape when it comes to dealing with the SPFL, SFA, referee issues, etc. Would Jim Gillespie have handled the the post match fallout at Parkhead, for example, at New Year a lot better than we we actually did? Because somehow, you know, very Rangers like we had the the right. Oh, there. Huge position of strength. We ended up on, ended yeah. up in the back foot, and we ended up in a in, a, in making a, a severe mess of it. So would he? be able to negotiate that, Chris. That was one of the big points. And the other big point is as well, right, this is where it becomes a wee bit problematic, right? This is the issue I have. He's coming from Kibble and he's coming from St Mirren part-time positions and stuff, thrust into the the position of CEO at Rangers, which is 24-7, full-time, very high profile. He's going to essentially be... Because John Bennett at the moment is too forward. He's, he's too much involved as a chairman, acting on so many different stages. He's going. The CEO is going to be the boss. He's going to be the man that runs the club while John Bennett is able to step back and oversee what things are happening, which should, in theory, stop things happening again that, that, that maybe have been happening recently that, that shouldn't have happened. So we understand that. But... How important is that to have that, Chris? I think that's a big question. How important is it that to have that kind of bridging gap? I think that's the right kind of thing I'm looking for. And is Jim Gillespie the man? And does that reflect maybe why there's so much questions over him? Because 
of how high profile the position is. Many people are saying it's an unnecessary gamble to take somebody like that. And while that makes sense, there is plus points for the landscape of Scottish football, etc. also, mm -hmm. surely. I think it, it strikes to almost the way that Rangers have been run as a club, not just the last couple of seasons, but for the last decade almost, almost since the uh, regime change. The, the chairman at Rangers has been such a big figure. You look at the way that Dave King was involved. It was Dave signs off on everything. Dave's the man that was signing the checks. When Dave spoke, people listened. When Stuart Robertson, for example, spoke on, on the rare occasions that he did, there wasn't that same, well, this is this is Stuart Robertson that's speaking. When Dave said something, well, it's Dave. I think there's there, there was that's changed slightly into into Douglas Park, who was less media friendly, I think is probably a, a polite way of putting it. Um and has then changed again into into John. Ultimately, if Rangers have a chief exec who is the main man at Ibrox, he's the man that drives standards, he's the man that controls every every aspect of, of the business, financially, marketing-wise, football-wise, up at the training ground. He is the ultimate line manager. That then, I think, lessens the requirement for the chairman to have to sign off on all these things. Now, as mentioned earlier on the show, John Bennett has had a lot of things on his on his plate over the last, over the last couple of months. If Rangers are operating properly as a football club and as a business, the chief exec takes all of that. The chief exec is the man that's, that's I said, driving all these things. It's him that's setting the mood. It's him that's setting the setting the standards around about the club. And the chairman can almost become something of a figurehead who speaks at the AGM, who speaks publicly every so often, but there's not that same demand of the chairman has to make things happen because the chief exec is the man that's making that's making things happen. And I think that's the that's a real challenge for, for Jim. He has to come in and assert himself on the staff, but has to come in and assert himself on Scottish football. Um, because we know that Rangers, throughout the seasons, as you mentioned earlier on, there's been the referees' issues, We've had various fights with the SPFL, various fights with the SFA, various fights with the media. And eventually Rangers have to get away from that war footing, stop fighting with people and actually start building relationships and getting things done and making making things happen. Um, heard stories of previous seasons um, about like, like visiting directors coming to Ibrox, go into the Blue Room, and it's almost a case of it's us and them. So the visiting directors are in one corner, the Rangers directors are in their corner, and never the two shall meet. You're not going to get things done. You're not going to build influence when you don't go and speak to other people. Now, it might only be... I don't know, a Dumbarton, just to pick clubs, Dumbarton, Clyde, Albion Rovers, whatever it is, whoever's at Ibrox, they have an SPFL vote. You have to try and win that vote. When you're trying to force through change, we know the situation with Neil Doncaster and Murdoch McLaren, Rangers clearly want them out. For that to happen, they have to build consensus. To build consensus, you have to build relationships. I think that's something that James got. You know, he was more... He was more public facing, he was more um, friendly, it was good to deal with from a press perspective, but he did want to go out and shake hands and try and make influence in, in different groups. And I think through all the, the KPIs, if you like, or through all the, the points that I'm sure John has been working through to appoint a chief exec, I think that would have had a big, a big part in it. Can I have somebody that knows the landscape, that knows the relationships, that knows who talks to who, that knows who picks up the phone to who, and can my man get in those relationships? Can he become a key a key driver in, in Scottish football? Um, I think that's overall, I say Rangers, as the position that they hold in the game, they should have more influence. You're only going to have influence with the right people, with the right mindset. Yeah, I think that's one of his, one of his biggest things, whoever it is, and we're assuming it's Jim Gillespie, mm -hmm. One of the biggest key things he must do, Chris, and this sounds really, really, really simplistic. He has to normalise this football club, mm -hmm. right? And and you'll laugh, and and I'm laughing. Well, yeah, it, ab but, absolutely spot on. Not right. When the last to, time Rangers, Rangers were normal. Yeah, he has to normalise this football club, which means, like you says, making friends, winning votes. You know, doing a wee bit of the the legwork and influencing people. So that when it does come to things that we're in a position of strength and not only normalizing that side of it, but also normalizing Chris as weird as it sounds and people laugh because it's so, so true. 
see when we go and do something, just make it straightforward. Right? <laughs> You're putting a statue up. It's going to be done by January. Just make it done by January. You're putting a statue. You're putting a a, a bit on the, the stadium. Just do it. And fans will begin to trust you because mm -hmm. it will become normal. You're looking to appoint a, a scout. You're looking to appoint a head of academy. Just get it done. Put the best person in place, right? Or put put somebody in place that the fans understand why you're doing it and, and what the thought process is about it. Do that. You'll, you'll instantly gain favour. Be open. Make yourself presentable to the media, to fan media. Speak to the supporters through your various avenues that you can. I don't think it's a difficult job directly to actually win people over. Mm -hmm. I think that if you if you proceed to do it properly, you know, then I think you can you can do that. And he doesn't have to worry about whoever's coming in the CEO doesn't have to worry about putting in a, a transfer strategy or putting in a people to do that. That's already there. So you've got Niels Kopp and you've got Philip come on in a long term kind of contract. He doesn't need to go and meddle in that. Mm -hmm. Doesn't need to fix that. That's there. The wage restructuring, the squad restructuring, it's already all been done. He doesn't need to go in and start having that as a number one concern. His number one concern is normalising this football club and, and making sure that when we do have issues with the referees, making sure we do have issues with SPFL or, or anything, that we can act normally as a football club and just rationally deal with it. You know, don't go from a position of strength to a position of weakness after one statement. That's the kind of thing that he needs to sort. That's what I want as my CEO. And there's a lot of negativity around Jim Gillespie, right? And I completely get it for reasons that we spoke about and highlighted. This is all point of this show, warts and all. You get it all out there. Well, what are the fans thinking? What's the outlook? This is what it is. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we, we will look forward to seeing how it all goes, Chris. I think that's pretty fair. I think there's a level of scrutiny for anyone that came in the door. Unfortunately for Jim Gillespie, he's got a number of issues immediately that, that the fans will bring with it. And I think that it all comes down to the fact that maybe the fans just don't trust the board to make that appointment correctly at this moment either because of absolutely everything that's happened also. So I think that the CEO one is one we'll come back to, but it's obviously... It's, it's a good one to discuss at this moment in time. And there's a lot of questions, I think, Chris. I think there's a lot of dubiety around what's going to happen with this one, Jim Gillespie, and, and is it the right one? So we're just going to have to let it play out. And we will have it played out um, in, in full red, white and blue technicolour over the, over, the coming, uh, over the coming weeks and months, no doubt. Folks, we will leave it there for today. Uh, my thanks to Stevie, as always, for his time, for his insight. Uh, we hope you enjoyed the second episode of The Talking Point. Uh, remember, you can check out uh, episode one on Ibrox, and we will be back in a couple of weeks uh, for our next show. Who knows what we'll be able to discuss. Uh, transfers, maybe I'll come into it. It will be after the after the old firm game, so uh, maybe more of a, of a football theme to that one. Um, but in, in the meantime... Keep across all the, the breaking news, the best insight, the best analysis on the Rangers Review website, and we will speak to you all soon. Thank you.